Welcome back to Fly Fishing Rutland Water. I'd like to thank you for coming back and if you like the video please remember to hit the like button and if you really want to see more of this remember to hit the subscribe button as well. I've had a few questions in the comments on the channel that I thought I could answer more effectively in a separate video rather than trying to remember to answer them when I'm doing the dialogue for the on location fishing. Although I'm not fishing in today's video, you will still see some fishy action. So today's video is really all about the tackle and tactics that I use for bank fishing on Rutland water. I moved to Rutland in 2006 and I've been fishing the banks of Rutland water for nearly 16 years now. But previous to that, I spent 10 years fishing from the boats and it always kind of filled me with a sense of foreboding about how you would ever go about fishing from the bank because it's such a large piece of water. There's about 27 miles of bank to choose from. So how on earth do you know where to start? When I was on the boat, I really broke the water down into a series of individual bays or areas and learned which tactics worked where. I also fished at a very specific time of the year. My friend and I used to come for the Mayday Bank holiday so we were pretty good at figuring out which tactics would work during that period of time. I also fished again in September and the tactics in September were completely different from the tactics I used back in May. But in those bi-yearly boat fishing sessions I got a fair idea of what worked where at each of those times of the year. So when it came to bank fishing it became more of a challenge. It was about figuring out where to fish on those 27 miles of bank at which times of the year and what tactics to use. I got off to a great start because when I bought my season ticket, when I was in the, the angling shop in the, the fishing lodge, I spotted this book. It's Rutland Water, A Bank Angler's Guide by Henry Lowe and John Wadham. Uh, now, what John Wadham doesn't know about fishing this reservoir isn't worth knowing. I think he's fished it pretty much since the reservoir was opened and he's very, very well regarded by the Rutland Water Fly Fishing Club. Now it's a fabulous book because what it does is, like I broke the water down into a series of bays or areas from the boat, this book does exactly the same thing. It breaks down the bank section by section and has detailed instructions on how to fish it under different conditions at different times of the year. The thing that really dominates choosing where to fish is the wind direction. You'll see in the videos, I talk very specifically about why I've chosen that point and the specific wind direction that is blowing on that particular day. That is probably the most important choice you have to make. I also use a bit of technology to help me. My iPhone. There's a couple of apps that I have on the iPhone that help me understand real detail about the wind conditions and how it's going to change over a particular period. So the app I use is called Windy. And what it does is it's designed for sailors. It gives you detailed information on the wind direction and strength pretty much hour by hour. And it's incredibly accurate. It also has a week long forecast. Now I find that incredibly useful. If I know what the conditions are going to be over a period of time, one of the things I try to do is to pick a spot when the wind is in the right direction, but also on a day where that wind direction has been sustained for two or three days. That means the fish will get into a systematic feeding process because the conditions have been consistent. Now that, that's not always the case, so sometimes you just have to pick your day. So primarily, I look at the app a couple of days before, I choose which day I'm going to fish on well in advance, and I make sure everything is ready for the session. One of the other techniques I use is, I obviously live very close to Rutland Water. Uh, Green Bank and Transformer are really only two miles away from my door, so I probably could walk there if I wanted to. That also gives me another huge advantage. I can do lots of scouting trips. There's a lovely walk that I like to do that takes me up the road to the peninsula, and I can walk up and over the peninsula. On that walk, I can see half of the north arm of the reservoir. And then if I go over the hill over the church, I can then see straight into Manson Bay, and then a little bit further down the hill, I can get a great view into the, the nature reserve. I can see the wind direction, the currents, where the ripple is, where the boats are. I can get a huge amount of intel on those trips. 
on one of those trips just a couple of days ago, I was walking along, saw a couple of boats sitting in Transformer where I'd heard there were lots of fish and saw the boats catching fish almost immediately. I chose not to bank fish that day because it was bright clear conditions and very little ripple. But the boats were able to find that ripple and effectively drift into the shallow water and they were catching lots of fish. I saw three fish caught within the space of about five minutes. It was also clear when I looked over into the north arm that all the boats were sitting in Hideaway Bay near the, the nature reserve. It takes a long time for the water to warm up in Rutland water. You've got to remember we've had an entire winter of cold conditions so although it's April the water temperature is quite cold because it simply hasn't had time to warm up yet. So a lot of the fish early in the season are in the margins hard against the banks or up in the shallow water in the nature reserve. And it's quite common for boats to be camped out in Hideaway Bay for really weeks on end. And then about the end of April, early May, it warms up just this time of year. And you can get some really, really big fish at the extreme ends of the arms in late April, early May. I've had all of my big brown trout up the top end of the arm. Two big ones off the bank in Green Bank. And one day I had a fabulous session on the boats just off Hideaway Bay. I caught three really big fish rainbows and browns in that exact spot. In terms of tackle, uh, the reel I use is a Snowbee Spectre, seven or eight rating, really nice reel, uh, but 200 pounds, comes with four cartridges, which means you can carry a few different lines with you on the bank. My main floating line is this, which would connect, and it has a rocket taper, weight forward seven line, perfectly balanced for my Loomis GLX distance rod. It's a fabulous line, um, it's, only about 30 pounds. It has a very short taper and a very long shooting head. And what that means is you don't have to aerialize very much line before you cast. Typically I can make two or three false casts before throwing out an incredibly long line. I really highly recommend the Witchwood Connect rocket taper. I also have a Superflow fly line, which is a still water taper. And I primarily use this one for boat fishing, um, but I have used it from the bank. Um, I used it in the Armley Wood video from last year and caught a lot of fish on it. And it's an equally fabulous line. But because this line is 50 pounds, it's a bit expensive to use on the banks of Rutland Water because you'll see that because of the bank remediation work, there's a lot of granite boulders and a lot of wire on the bank. So it's very, very easy to catch your line, rip it and tear it on the wire or the boulders. So I prefer to use an inexpensive line that means that if I damage it, I can go just straight along to the tackle shop and buy another one almost right away and not feel too much of a financial burden. I have a third line that I use, which is this Rio Midge tip, which is this intermediate sinking tip on the floating line. It's primarily useful when the fish are feeding on buzzers or imitative patterns just under the surface and you want the flies to be down a little bit in the water, but not fully submerged. Uh, so if you want to present non-weighted patterns under the water, then a midge tip is ideal. I carry those three lines in my bag, but what I would say is that 95% of the time, I just use the Witchwood Rocket Taper. I find that just by changing the point fly, I can change the depth and characteristics of how the fly fishes. And you'll see that happening a lot in the videos. You'll see I'm incredibly impatient about tactics and I'm changing tactics every four or five casts. So that's the tackle. What I'd like to do now is jump into the fly box because I've also had questions about the patterns I use and why I use them. So when I go bank fishing, I carry two boxes. This one has all of the flies I need for an entire season on Rutland water in one box. And it's designed so I can put it on my inside pocket so that when I go out wading, I have everything I need with me on my person. Because in some of the spots, when you wade into them, the reservoir bed is clay and sandstone and the clay doesn't take much to get disturbed and it will get mucky and it will mess up the water clarity in the water. So if I'm wading, I want to wade out to a point very, very carefully. And then when I'm there, I want to stay there. I don't want to move. I don't want to have to go back to the bank and get my net because every time I do that, I will effectively churn up that clay and muddy the water. And that's really, really bad. You want the water clarity to be as clear as possible if you're fishing these imitative patterns. So that's my main fly box. I carry a second fly box in my bag that has what I would call my wild card patterns. 
Some things that I won't use on a daily basis, but under certain conditions, that might be the fly that I need. So it's almost like my wildcard box. If nothing else is working, I can go to the other fly box in the bag and maybe find the one fly that I wouldn't normally carry with me, but that might be incredibly useful on that day. So without further ado, let's jump into the fly boxes and have a real detailed look at what's in there. So let's take a look inside the box. You can see the box is in four sections. An entire section is dedicated to buzzers because of all the flies that, that I have used, particularly in early season, I catch most of my fish on buzzers. So this second section is imitative wet fly patterns. Um, it really falls into a number of categories. There are these bloodworm imitations, a few pheasant tail nymphs, gold ribbed hare's ears, then a whole section of crunchers and nemos. Um, after buzzers, these are the flies that predominantly catch fish for me. Over on the left hand section I have a selection of dalbachs. I tend to use these as point flies. If we look all of the buzzers and the crunchers and nemos effectively get fished on the droppers. And then on the point I'll either have a large buzzer, sometimes with a gold head, or bead head. I've never caught a fish on a pheasant tail nymph or gold ribbed hare's ear on Rutland water. There are flies that I've used on other still waters but have never worked on Rutland for me. So what's on the other side of the box? In the second half of the box, it's kind of all about specialist flies uh, that are generally on the point and they're either fished on the surface or they're fished down below. So I've got a lot of dry patterns over here which can be fished as a floating point fly or simply as a, a dry fly on their own. Then I've got a bunch of weighted patterns. There's also things like these uh, boobies and buoyant patterns which again I'll fish on the point. So this is really a weird combination of lures and dry flies. I've also got these things which I've never been able to bring myself to use. These little floats that you can use to do the, the washing line buzzer where you can fish three buzzers below this. It's a, a bit too much like float fishing. I've had them in my box but I always kind of feel a little bit guilty that I've I've stepped into the realms of coarse fishing if I, if I ever dare to use these things. But they do work. I've seen them used to great effect by a whole bunch of, 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 of anglers. Though I have to say they probably use more in the boat than they are from the bank. So let's look at some individual flies that I specifically use in some of these early season videos. I'll pull each of them out of the box in turn and then show you them up close. So the first one I use, often use this on the point or the top dropper, is this little buzzer. And it has yellow cheeks and some kind of red tag here as a trigger point. A fairly plain buzzer, has a black body with some peacock herald, but it's, it's very effective. If I fish that one on the point of the dropper, then I'll generally fish something like this on the second dropper. Uh, this one, very similar, black body, stripped peacock herald rib, orange cheek this time, um, and I'll fish that on a dropper. This one also has a little bit of flash. Uh, on the top to give it an extra trigger point and just make it stand out from what else is in the water. And I'll generally fish those in different sizes. These buzzers can be quite useful in Rutland. The buzzers aren't always black so I always have a green buzzer somewhere to hand just in case I need to change colour. Um, you can see I've got all sorts of variations of colour in here but these are the ones that I would class as my go-to buzzers. With the black buzzers, I also like these things, these epoxy buzzers. They've got a slightly different look to them, a little bit more sparse um, and a different shape of hook, more of a grub hook, but they do work very, very effectively. And this is a slightly different variation. Again, more of an epoxy buzzer, similar pattern to the, the standard buzzer pattern here, but fished on a grub. And sometimes I find that the variation in shape and pattern and colour it's really all you need to do when you're fishing buzzers. So let's look at some of the other flies. Um, I'll generally fish some kind of dalbach on the point. Um, this one, again, your classic dalbach pattern with peacock herl. And again, white cheek, white flashes on the cheeks and a bit of red flash on the top, just to give it a bit of colour. Um, I really like these ones. 
when there's a, this is a great point fly. Again, it's more of a grub hook pattern, a little bit heavier. That can add a little bit of weight and help you get your buzzers deeper in the water. Sometimes I'll fish these buzzers. I like these ones that have some kind of little breathing filaments. It just looks a little different. That combination of six different types of buzzers, now I have lots, you can see I've got lots of them. I'll generally have eight of each fly in the box just to make sure that if the fish are taking, I never run out of flies because it's quite a long way back to the, the tackle shop or back to the tying room if you run out. Uh, what else do we use? Um, crunchers. I really love crunchers. Discovered this from an article by one of the Bar Brothers and I've, I use this an awful lot in the middle fly. It's representative of all, of all sorts of different types of fly life in the water and it's just a great all-round fly that works well on the second dropper. Um, I love Nemo's. I usually fish, I'll often fish a size 10 Nemo on the point fly or size 12 on a dropper. I always fish the point fly slightly larger than the dropper. And that's really it. I've got other variations of dialbacks that I'll go to. This one looks a little bit like a pin fry. It's got a little bit of, again, flash on here that gives it a little bit of colour. But again, that set of patterns there is probably all you need for the complementary imitative patterns to go along with your buzzers. Then we come to the point fly. A lot of you will have seen me fishing this fly. The Armley Wood videos, Old Hall Bay videos, and the Yellowstone videos from 2015. This fly always catches fish early season. It's got a yellow head, large black marabou tail, but not a massive fly. This fished on a variable retrieve, sometimes fast, sometimes slow, is a fabulous early season fly. And I've always got something like this in my box. I'll fish this on the point with dalbacks and buzzers above it. And sometimes the fish will take this fly. Sometimes it just gives a bit of weight to the cast and gets these flies deeper in the water where the fish will take them. So these are a great complementary mix. This is a slightly different variation. This one, similar pattern, but slightly different body, a little bit more flashy on the body, but you can see very similar. Um, the other fly I use a lot, or I always use a lot, but haven't caught very many fish on recently, is the cormorant. It's a nice point fly because it can imitate um, all sorts of different fly life, from insect life to, to pin fry to, to goodness knows what. Um, I've not caught a fish on a, on a cormorant for about five years. It tends to be a, a fly that I use to get the right depth for the imitative patterns. But in the last video, I caught two fish on a cormorant. So I'm quite pleased with that. The other fly I often use early season is a booby. If I'm fishing the washing line, sometimes I'll fish a really ugly booby on the point. And all this does is keeps the flies in the water. If this fly is on the point, and you have your droppers hanging from it, it means that you are fishing in the surface film. So when I talk about washing line, I generally have one of these flies on the point. Um, what else do I use? Um, there's the classic humongous flies. If you want to get a bit of weight on your flies onto the point to take your flies a little bit deeper, then humonguses, either silver or gold, work equally well. I discovered these flies last year, sometimes in about June, it can get very, very difficult. The fish are feeding on pin fry and are incredibly difficult to catch. So someone showed me these flies here. This is totally buoyant. And if you apply some uh, gink to this, it's almost unsinkable. And what it does is the fly sits on the surface film with the body of the fly under the water and this sitting protruding from the surface and it looks like a dead pin fry in the water. I caught my very first fish on the surface using this last year, uh, nearly six pound. It's the first fish I've taken on a dry fly in Rutland water. And when these things work, they work incredibly well. So I have a few of those. Although I have this massive box to choose from, this is the selection of flies that I will rotate through in a session. And you've seen that I'm very, very impatient 
but actually by chopping and changing through these patterns I can change the depth, I can change the nature of the insect that I am trying to imitate, all sorts of factors and it generally homes in on where the fish are. And again, I make no apology for the lack of patience because it does work. That's a selection of flies that will work well on Rutland water. So I hope you found this video helpful. If you have, again, please remember to hit the like button and also hit the subscribe button. It's helping me build up a good following on the channel, which is making a real difference in terms of how many people are finding it on both YouTube and Google. So for all of you that have been watching, thank you so much for coming to the channel. And for those of you that have commented, thanks to you for engaging with me and giving me some insight into the topics that you'd like me to cover in these videos. So we'll finish this video in our usual way. Thanks for watching.